For Queens Park watchers of a certain generation, the name Darcy McHugh still rings a lot of bells. McHugh won his first election to the legislature in 1963, ran for the PC party leadership in 1971, losing to Bill Davis, but then becoming Davis's minister of just about everything. McHugh left politics, prematurely many say, in 1978 and had a successful career in the private sector after. He recounts it all in his new memoir. It's called The Duke of Kent and Darcy McHugh. The Duke of Kent joins us now. It's great to see you again. Nice to be here. Okay, first question I got to ask is, you're about the most partisan Tory I've ever met in my life. Oh, no. So let's ask, why are you a Tory anyway? Well, I wasn't brought up one particularly, but uh, I think it was Colonel Drew who uh, quoted somebody, said a conservative to remember St. Paul, stand fast, hold on to that which is good. And that rings a bell with you. And that rings a bell with me. Okay. Uh, I'm going to read a quote from your book now, one of a few that we'll read here, on maybe why you ended up in politics. Uh, here we go, from the Duke of Kent. When I was a child, my parents were curious what my profession would be. <laughs> my father put a Bible, a bottle, and a deck of cards on the table. The idea was, if I picked up the Bible, I'd go into the church. If the bottle, I'd become a drunkard. And if I took the cards, a gambler. When I grabbed all three, mother shrieked, my God, he's going to be a politician. There you go. Why, why did you end up running for politics? That is not really a true story, but I don't know where <laughs> that story came from, but it is still in my story file, and I used it innumerable times. Why'd you get in? Why? I think, uh, I, I think as I say in the book, uh, I was the sixth uh, person of my family to be involved in politics. It was a uh, family tradition, obligation, I guess, in some way. Great-grandfather, great grandfather, both mayors. Father was a, a school trustee. And uh, I think perhaps the other reason was that I wasn't married, was looking for more to do, something more to do. I guess back in those days, you married, quote-unquote, late in life, eh? I did, yes. Huh. Okay. Your first election, as we suggested, was 1963, your first provincial election, and John Robarts was the premier of the province at the yes. time. What did you like about him so much? Oh, he was just a great guy. He, uh, he was uh, a man's man. I, I, that's probably a, an old-fashioned phrase, too, but uh, he was patient. He was tolerant. He was uh, a, a listener. And as prime minister, and also Mr. Davis, uh, a minister, or I was, where he was given a full free hand. And uh, only when you got into trouble did you hear from him. We just saw a picture of him holding a baby. I guess that's yours. Well, no, my wife's. <laughs> <laughs> and he was godfather to your child? Yes, to my second child, Jamie. Hmm. Nice. In 1966, so three years after, you first won your first election. He put you into cabinet as minister without portfolio. You were 33 years old. Did you not think you were too young to be in Canada? Yes, and I was surprised because uh, Mr. Robarts himself, I think, had been a back, was a backbencher for eight years mm -hmm. before he went into the cabinet, and uh, I wasn't expecting it, but uh, he was determined to move the world ahead, to, I guess, say goodbye to some people nicely, and to bring on the revivists who were sworn in, all pretty young on that day in 66. We saw it again happen earlier this year. Kathleen Wynne put seven new people in cabinet and said goodbye to some of the older faces. Well, she did it because she had to. <laughs> See, what did I say about you being a partisan Tory? Okay. Now, a year after that, he gives you a huge promotion to Minister of Municipal Affairs, and what did you say to him? I said I'd think about it. You said, give me the weekend to think about it. What kind of chutzpah is that? It was cheeky. It was cheeky. Uh, what were you thinking? Well, I was, I was amazed that, that uh, and that was a hot spot, very much of a hot spot, because there had been all these reports and great things were expected. And the person who was on the spot was going to be the Minister of Municipal Affairs. And I wrestled with it over the weekend, not too hard, and said yes. Back in your day, we should explain to pe for people who don't sort of remember the way it was at Queen's Park 40 or 50 years ago, MPPs and members of the press gallery used to get together after hours, basically at an illegal speakeasy at Queen's Park and have, you know, have some booze together. That doesn't happen anymore. Was it better back then? 
it, it wasn't only after hours. It wasn't only after hours. <laughs> it was hours. during business hours, too. <laughs> yes. Okay. Sometimes we went up before lunch. <laughs> <laughs> and was it better then? Well, it, it was, uh, yes, it was, it was uh, our relationship with the press, uh, I think, was uh, friendly, perhaps too friendly, uh, from their point of view, or at least looking back. Uh, there were no perceived conflicts at that point, and uh, if they wanted a story, you got to know a member or a minister, and that would not happen now. We actually should establish why this book is called The Duke of Kent. That's your nickname. How'd well, you get, how'd Albert you get that? Well, Sofa nicknamed me that, and so uh, I was called that and it's for stuck. quite a long while. Let's move ahead. 1971, after John Robarts retires, you run for the PC leadership at the age of 38, which coincidentally is the same age the current Ontario PC party leader is, Patrick yeah. Brown, 38. What made you think at 38 you were ready to be Premier of Ontario? I wasn't sure that I was. I would have liked Mr. Robarts to stay around longer. I don't think you can go into, into politics without uh, aspiring for the top at some point or another, and I aspired for the top. As I say, I wish Mr. Robarts had stayed a little longer because I needed more time to build up a, a base of, of support. Plus, I was in a very unpopular job, or unpopular with a lot of people, municipal affairs. How come? regional government, restructuring government. That was you. That was me. Yeah. It was, it was me, it was, but it had been recommended by everybody. And there were a whole series of, by committees of the legislature, by royal commissioners, and uh, by eminent people. And uh, it, it had to happen. But just so people who are watching this program understand this, there's a Durham region and a York region and a Halton region because of you. You're the guy who put all those local municipalities together in one big regional government. Well, two of those I really didn't, but I laid the groundwork for them. They were done just after I got out the first time. How about the city of Thunder Bay? The city of Thunder Bay was all mine. <laughs> all mine. And it's called Thunder Bay today instead of Port William and Fort Arthur because? It should have been called the Lakehead. But uh, one of my big mistakes was I said, well, we'll have a referendum to decide this. And the, and the names were chosen by school kids, I think, grade eight kids. And the names were uh, Lakehead, The Lakehead, and Thunder Bay. Mm. And clearly, the combination of Lakehead and The Lakehead won hands down. But Thunder Bay came out ahead, so we swallowed and said Thunder Bay, which was also the name of the whole district, which was mm. sort of too bad. However, it's, it's stuck and it's a good name and people still call it the Lakehead. Yes, they do. You are very candid about the comments of your Premier uh, in this book. You're very com candid, excuse me, in your comments about the Premier. And I want to read a couple of excerpts from the book in which you describe Bill Davis thus. I did not look up to Davis in the same way I did to Robarts, who was 16 years my senior. Davis and I were only four years apart. He was almost shy. I never got to know him well. We were not dinner or drinking pals, but Davis was a much better husband and father than I. Or this one. There were times when Davis was too cautious for me, and we certainly didn't see eye to eye on every issue. But the fact that he kept such a diverse group working together as a team was his greatest strength and the reason for his durability. Few are the politicians as canny and accomplished as he. Whenever I was meeting with someone, if Bill Davis came into the room and joined the group, I always stood and called him sir. You, I mean, you write about this in the book, and I think I have independent knowledge of this as well. You never try to undermine him, as many second-in-commands often do to their premier because they want the same job. How did that relationship work? Well, I don't... <laughs> I'm sure I never, never tried to undermine him, uh, and hopefully didn't. Uh, he was the leader. He was the boss. And uh, one could argue things with him, certainly, and have disagreements with him, but when he made up his mind, he was the boss and that was it. This picture we've put up right now, I think, is so uh, effective at reflecting your relationship. There's you if, you, if I may say, pontificating in the house once again, and look at him, looking up and laughing at you and just having a grand time. That was in the middle of a budget, and uh, Tom McMillan actually gave me the line which I had written somewhere on my desk. and. At the right moment when the opposition were heckling, 
I said, you're nothing more than the parliamentary equivalent of the gong show. <laughs> and he liked that line. He liked that he line. He was smiling big time. Um, okay, when Mr. Davis replaced Mr. Robarts as Premier, he, at a certain point, made you the minister of just about everything. No, you, not quite. Well, I'm going to make a list here. You were the treasurer, you're the minister of economics, you were the chairman of the treasury board, and then a year later, you added municipal affairs as well. You had all of those portfolios at once. Yeah. Uh, the treasurer had typically been uh, both the, the treasurer and chairman of, of what was then called treasury board. The point is, you were the money man for Ontario, Inc. Yes. Was that not too much responsibility for one person? I didn't think so. I know. Yeah. <laughs> In your case, maybe it wasn't enough responsibility. Right? No, it was enough. <laughs> I have often heard you described as the original common sense revolutionary. In other words, before Mike Harris, because you were a real small-c conservative, the story goes, when you were treasurer. And yet, Mr. McHugh, I'm going to make a list here of some of the things you did. This is in your first budget alone. You increased spending by almost 11%. And in subsequent budgets, you increased taxes on beer, on wine, on cigarettes, on liquor, on gasoline. Pipe tobacco. Pipe tobacco. Let's not forget that. You brought in four consecutive deficits north of a billion dollars, which at the time was the largest in Ontario history. You offered $1,500 grants to first-time home buyers. You increased the guaranteed annual income for 300,000 seniors. How exactly is any of that conservative? Well, I guess I would be described as a red Tory, uh, as well as a conservative, and I, I, I accept that. The deficit then was not as important. Uh, what was important, Mr. McNaughton had left this, these words of wisdom with your, me. Your predecessor. My predecessor that what was important was the cash requirements. And we had more money coming in, paying back old things which Mr. Frost had created, uh, than was going out. So for quite a long time, we didn't have to borrow at all. Uh, we were running a deficit, but the cash requirements were, were nil. And a couple of those things that you mentioned, like the $1,500 homeowner grant, uh, the economy wasn't as strong at certain points mm -hmm. as one would like it to be, and we were stimulating, purely stimulating. And we not only did that, but we, for eight or nine months, took the reduced the sales tax on cars, I think from 7 to 5 percent, I've forgotten. And people argued that all you were doing was drawing things forward, uh, which was true, but it worked. It worked. It got things going, got jobs created. And that was good. Later on, I was trying very hard to balance the budget and had a plan to balance the budget, and I'd forgotten now the year or so after I left, but it didn't happen. We'll get to your departure uh, later. Should we talk about your worst moment in politics? You do talk about it in the book, so why not? <laughs> oh, well, when I had to resign, yes. yes. Or when I resigned. I didn't have to, but I did. It was 1972. There was yes. an article in the Globe and Mail suggesting something fishy about a land deal in Chatham, which was the part of the province you represented. Um, you want to give us just sort of what the gist of the, the problem they alleged was? Well, they, what, actually what they, uh, it was a man named Zaritsky. What he alleged was, was, was uh, basically true, that uh, through a family company, I was a part owner, I think 12th, of a uh, new subdivision in Chatham. Uh, which uh, uh, had been approved by the Department of Municipal Affairs. Not only approved by the Department of Municipal Affairs, but the stamp on the plan of subdivision said W.D.R.C. McHugh Minister. That's you. That's, well, that was me. Uh, the plan itself, it should be said, was not controversial. Uh, the department or agencies recommended some changes which were agreed to by the owners and it went ahead. Lots were sold off and houses were built. Do you have any idea that this was going on? No. So all this happened, you were unaware of the fact that all of this was going on? Well, yes, except uh, I knew enough about life that uh, what the, uh, my brother and the other partners were doing uh, required approvals, and I suppose I must have known that. There was quite a foo-for-a at the time. Well, no and, question. And you had a lunch with John Robarts to seek his no, counsel? I, I went over and had a drink. I, I was in Chatham, went home. Went home to, I was in England, in Europe, the opening of the Olympics. Uh, got 
the message, came to London, read the papers. Some Air Canada pilot sitting on a bench handed me the paper, so I read the paper and we flew home. And I went right to Chatham and had calls the next morning, including from Mr. Robarts, and said, where are you? And I said, in Chatham, sir. And he said, well, you better get down here. So I met with him that night, and I'd really, I think, 90% made up my mind what I should do. And uh, he didn't say what I should do, but I sensed what he thought I should do. Which was resign. Which, so I went to the office, and we ha had a team there who wrote a lengthy, lengthy statement. And at about 10 o'clock, I realized that uh, uh, I wasn't really contributing a hell of a lot, so I went home, and Phil Lind gave me a piece of paper. He said, this is an ending, words for the ending, if you want to use them. And I looked at them the next morning and decided they were, that was essentially right, that I should resign. Did you ever think about toughing it out? Oh, right up until I read the <laughs> words, I think, <laughs> <laughs> yes. But it was the right thing to do because it's not, uh, it's not the fact, it's the perception of the fact. And the perception was that, that I was, had done the wrong thing. In 1978, you wrote Bill Davis a letter. You said to him, I'm quitting politics, and here's how you decide, described it in the book. You said, I was bored. I attended too many meetings where I said to myself, God, I've heard all this before. There were times I would doze. I realized I wasn't going anywhere because the Premier wasn't going anywhere. I had always been loyal and remained so. I would never have tried to push out Premier Davis, but I came to the conclusion that if I couldn't be Premier, I should resign. Mr. Davis and you go out to lunch together. He says, I'm not going anywhere. So you say, I'm gone. Then I'm gone, yeah. Did it he... took about four months, actually, from writing the letter to getting the lunch, but our... Uh, did he try and talk you out of leaving? Oh, yes. He did? Yes. But what? Oh, I'd made, you know, I was, I don't know that I was, how bored, I, I worried that I was being rude because I'd heard all these things before and mm. I don't know that I dozed off that much, but I, I was bored. And I'd lost two or three big fights in, in, in cabinet, not lost them, realized that they couldn't be won. Mm. Uh, Mark and Fatty assessment was won. And there was no way we could go ahead with that in, in, in a minority government. Uh, it took me a little while to realize a couple of those things, but I realized that what I uh, was working for was not going to happen quickly. And we had just been re-elected in 77 to a, a little better minority government, what was still a minority government, and the majority didn't come back till 82. Mm, 81. How much does it still bother you today that you never got to be Premier of Ontario? Oh, I'm long over that, long over How that. How long did it take to get over that? <laughs> well, it, I put the question a different way. Did you miss it? And uh, I say in the book that, I, oh, for two or three years after I got out, something would happen. I'd say, how much better it would be if I'd been there to look after it. <laughs> and that soon disappeared, and, and uh, with any thought of Premier, and Mr. Davis, privately, I guess, and through intermediate in 82 when he was leaving, urged me to run, and I wrestled with that for a while. This was 85, actually. 85, 85 yeah. He, he, well, I guess he announced in 84. He actually stepped down in 85. Did you think about running after he did leave? A little bit, and a group, uh, my best friends got together, and we had a meeting and discussed the pros and cons, and I finally decided no. Too many cons? The fire wasn't in my belly by then, and uh, uh, you know we had been in power then for I guess 43 years. Sooner or later, we were going to lose. I didn't want to be around to be the person who, who did. You were first elected in 1963, one of 108 MPPs at Queens Park. How many of those 108 are still with us? There are only six, to my knowledge. Uh, Mr. Davis, uh, Bob Nixon, both of whom were elected before 63, mm -hmm. in by-elections actually, and in the 63 crop, myself, Gordy Carton, Stephen Lewis, Alan Eagleson. Six left. Do you guys still get together? Oh, yes. You do? We are very soon. Mr. Eagleson convenes us for lunch. We take turns paying for us, and we got a group of people. 
not all Tories. The Right Honorable John Turner is a regular attender. Hmm. You allow a liberal in your midst. <laughs> it's very ecumenical of you. I want to read one more quote from the book because I think if there's one story that really reflects how different politics is today from back then, this is it. There was no staff at the Chatham Airport with its grass runway <laughs> where I was regularly dropped off late at night. There would be a note on the chalkboard saying, leave the lights on the runway, Darcy is coming in tonight. Then there was a second line adding, Darcy, please turn the lights off when the plane has taken off. <laughs> it was a simpler time, wasn't yes, it? Yes, it was. <laughs> As you think back on it, was it a better time to be in to be in public life? Was it better to do it back then as opposed to today? Well, it was certainly nicer, better, I guess, too, but nicer. It uh, it was much much less confrontational. Today, it, it gets pretty nasty. Now, in fairness, see, I can be fair. <laughs> uh, Mr. Trudeau does seem to be trying rather hard to restore a little more civility to the House of Commons. Amen. So you're into sunny ways. You don't mind that Up at all? Up to a point. Up to a point. Okay. <laughs> you're not taking over. I'm not agreeing with him, but <laughs> you, they are trying. You don't mind the change in tone? No, I think it's for much, for the, for much better. Good. Well, I, I thoroughly enjoyed the book, I have to say. It was a great read. The Duke of Kent, a memoir by Darcy McHugh with Rod McQueen. And a forward by the former Prime Minister, Brian Mulroney. Mr. McHugh, it's great to see you again. Nice to be here. Thank you. Help TVO create a better world through the power of learning. Visit TVO.org and make a tax-deductible donation today.